Let us pray. Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection sanctify your servants, for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established this paschal mystery, lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human resemblance and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man. So shall he startle many nations. Because of him, Kings shall stand speechless, for those who have not been told shall see, those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured. While we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, or a sheep before the shearers, he was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny when he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people? A grave was assigned him among the wicked and a burial place with evildoers, though he had done no wrong nor spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. He gave us his life as an offering for sin. He shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty. Because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked, and he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for those offenses. The word of the Lord.
Second reading is a reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who was unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Who are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus, the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So again he asked them, Who are you, who are you looking for? They said, Jesus, the Nazarene. I told you that I am, so that you are looking to me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a silver, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into the scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of souls. The tribune and the Jewish guard seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. And 
he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid who was the gatekeeper said to Peter, You are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken boldly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in a temple area where all of the Jews gathered. And in the secret, I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there, keeping warm, and they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Again, Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. It was morning, and they themselves did not enter the Praetorium in order not to be defiled, so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this Pilate said to them, Take it yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone. In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king. Jesus answered, You say, I am a king. For this I was born. And for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is the truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again. Not this one, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. 
and they struck him repeatedly. Once more Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take it yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to the law he ought to die, because he made himself the son of God. Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him, so Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and I have the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out. If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold, your king. They cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews. But that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, in order that the passage of Scripture might be fulfilled that says, They divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus, where his mother and mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of ice and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had 
taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of the week was a solemn one. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness had testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth, so that you also may come to believe. For this happened, so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again another passage says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus, and Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloths, along with the spices, according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had been buried. So they laid Jesus there because the Jewish preparation day for the tomb was closed by. The Gospel of the Lord. passion of Christ today. I think the words of emptiness and loss come to mind. Think of what Jesus has lost. His mobility. He is fastened to the cross. Mobility lost. Think of that he also lost the apostles in their support for him. Only John was at the foot of the cross. Where were the other apostles? But Judas betrayed him. Peter denied him. The other ones were in the upper room. Peter was there too, but there they were, frightened. And also, we think the loss of just his physical strength. His body was continually weakened by the scourging, all the suffering he endured on the cross. You know, when you look at a Good Friday service, it's always been this way as we celebrate Good Friday. You look around the sanctuary, and we see emptiness. First of all, what is missing, and number one is missing, is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. The only day throughout the whole world that we do not celebrate the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And we feel longing, an emptiness, a loss, it's missing. And we look around the sanctuary and we see there are no flowers, no bells, no altar cloth at this point, any fancy altar cloths, no, ca no candlesticks around. Very empty, very bleak, very barren sense of loss. 
I mean, think of what the world and our nation is going through right now with the pandemic, COVID-19 virus. We see loss here, there, and everywhere. It's almost like, as we look at the sanctuary, that things are frozen, suspended animation. The world is like that right now because of the COVID-19 virus. Things are suspended. Things are closed. So much loss. Number one loss, of course. The most serious is the loss of human life. We think of how many have died throughout the world and are still dying from the COVID-19 virus. And then we think of ourselves, maybe, what we have to do and give up. We're under a travel ban. You know, we uh, can't gather. The church is empty, so we can't gather in groups to worship. Um, we have all kinds of restrictions. But for a good purpose, of course. For good purposes, saving precious human life. All because of this COVID-19 uh, virus. So an experience of, we can take the loss and emptiness that we feel at this time, and we can take it as a cross, the pandemic cross, uh, a shadow over the whole earth at this time, and for ourselves. We could rail against it, but that's not good, it won't get us anywhere. Or we, as we take up our cross and put up with our struggles or inconveniences, or even big losses like people losing their employment or, or, or their business, we take it up the cross, but at the same time, our eyes are on others who are suffering. And you see that so much throughout our country, people helping each other, you know, still caring, not allowing their hearts to become hardened through it all. So the cross. You know, we avoid the cross, but it's a mystery, isn't it? Of course. If it wasn't for the cross of Jesus Christ dying on the cross, we would never experience the new life the salvation, the resurrection that he has for us. It's through the cross. That's why we Catholics firmly believe in having a cross with a corpus on it, the body of Christ, because we realize only through his passion death do we enter new life and the resurrection. You know, think of the, the good thief that was on his cross next to Jesus. Certainly he didn't want to be there. He was suffering. But if he had not not been on that cross... He would not have had the opportunity to be in the presence of Jesus, to meet Jesus, to hear him, to know him, to believe in him at that moment, to trust him, and to know his mercy and forgiveness, and to hear those words that Jesus said to him today, you will be with me in paradise. If he had not been on the cross, I would not have experienced that. It's a mystery how God can take crosses and turn him into victory. The ultimate cross that he turned into victory, a cross of cruel, cruel torture, emblem and actual torture, and turn it into a victory for us Christians because Jesus conquered sin and death on that cross and rose again. And we had to go through the cross to his resurrection. The cross is so essential. You know, just, we have some beautiful stations of the cross here, and as, as you look at some of these, and I'm looking at some and thinking, of what's happening in the world right now. When Jesus was arrested, taken into captivity, can't help but think, and you too probably, of all those who are ill in the hospital right now with the COVID-19 virus, they're, they're in kind of a captivity. They may be on a ventilator. They can't move that much. They're lost their mobility, like Jesus on the cross. And we pray for them for their healing. And we think of him taking the cross on his shoulders. This represented, of course, all the suffering and sin of the world, but he willingly took his cross on his shoulders. And we think of the cross of, of the pandemic virus and what it's causing and people taking it up and moving forward. And we think of the, uh, Jesus meeting his mother. And apparently the Romans, that were soldiers there, did not allow Mary to get close to him. You know, it says they looked at each other in each other's eyes. It's such longing how she wished she could have gave them an embrace but was not allowed. Again, we think of people suffering from the COVID-19 virus. There are people who are actually dying in a hospital. I heard that the family cannot come in. 
they can't get close to them because of how contagious it is. So they have to deal with saying goodbye from a distance. And then if they die, they're grieving, you know, from some of the distance and all the precautions that are needed to help prevent the spread of this virus. So Jesus knows what it is to, he would have loved to reach out to his mother and embrace her, but there was that distance as we talk about keeping our distance. And then Jesus is helped carrying his cross by Simon of Cyrene. Where were the apostles? None of them helped at that point, but Simon of Cyrene was a, from uh, Libya in North Africa. He was a stranger. He was commandeered into doing that, but he did. But I'm thinking of all the people that are not commandeered into helping at the time of this virus and are reaching out in a variety of creative ways, inspired by the Spirit, helping those who are in need. And then I think of Veronica wiping the face of Jesus. Jesus' face was covered with blood and the dust from the road and, and how comforting he must have felt to have his face wiped and cleared. Then that reminds me of all the medical profession right now that are working with people with the kind of virus, how they're comforting them, helping them, putting their own lives in danger on the front lines of the disease, reaching out touching them and comforting them in a variety of ways and caring for them. The doctors, the nurses, the technicians, the physics assistants, and on and on, and all kinds of technicians who are doing that. They're like Veronica, holding out the towel to wipe the face of those who are suffering. And so when we think of all this, and we think of um, Jesus, uh, as before he was put on the cross, uh, stripped of his garments. Again, we think of everyone who was suffering People stripped of their, their health through this, and people stripped of their jobs and their employment and their business, and so many is, is being a stripping that's occurring. Again, we cannot allow ourselves to become uh, embittered, can't rail at it. We, we need to pray that we would take up our cross and move forward. We only can do that with God's grace. Again, I think of the good thief on the cross. God turned that cross into a means of salvation for him. He hadn't been there, he would have missed the opportunity for the great mercy and love of God. And so this is what we think of today. And we heard in the gospel, passion, we read it, <clears throat> that when Jesus died, he cried out, it is finished. And the Hebrew and the part of like the Aramaic word that he used was kala. That's how it was said, kala, meaning it is finished. That comes from when all the people brought their Passover lambs to Jerusalem from all over Ju Judah for the Passover. They took, as I said yesterday at, my, at the Mass, that they took the lambs to the Levite priest, uh, kind of the junior priest, as I said, uh, for, the, for the, the Levite priest to kill the lambs. But when it was completed, the last lamb was brought forth to be killed the Levites were not allowed to kill it. Only the high priest. So the high priest killed the lamb for the sacrifice. And then what did the high priest yell out? Only he yelled out this word. It is finished. Kala. And that's what Jesus said in those same words. And Jesus is the high priest on the cross, on the altar of the cross. And he says it's finished. Meaning all this torture and, and this part of this work of salvation that is so, was so uh, torturing in a sense, so difficult, he went through it. It's finished, but we know that there's a new life that begins. We know that there's a new Passover. We move into the future. We move into new life. There is light, the light of Christ. As we go through the cross of this scourge that we have been throughout the world through this pandemic, as we go through it, no, as we turn to Christ, Jesus, he'll be the light there at the end of the tunnel, you might say. But the only way is for us now all to go to the cross. We know he'll be there and with us now and then be waiting for us at the other side of the cross to new life as we look forward to celebrating the resurrection once again.
let us pray. Beloved to the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God, the Father Almighty. Let us kneel. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy that your church spread throughout the whole world. May persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name to Christ our Lord. Amen. For our Holy Father, Pope Francis, let us pray. Also for our most Holy Father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord, who chose him to be for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Let us kneel. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you, their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith in Christ our Lord. Amen. And let us pray also for our Bishop Ronald, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, and for the whole of the faithful people, let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose Spirit the whole body of the Church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for the catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts, and unlock the gifts of his mercy that having received forgiveness of all their sins to the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty and ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens that be born in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children to Christ our Lord. And let us pray also for our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth to gather them together and keep them one in the church. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, who gather what is scattered, and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bonds of charity through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for the Jewish people, to whom the Lord our God spoke first. He may grant them to advance in the love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Let us kneel.
Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. And let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter into the way of salvation. Let us kneel. Almighty, ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart they may find the truth, and that we ourselves, being con constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your, of your life, may we be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world through Christ our Lord. Let us pray for those who do not believe, do not acknowledge God, that following what is right and sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God Himself. Let us kneel. Almighty and ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest, grant we pray that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you. And so in the gladness, confess you, the one true God, and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will. For the true peace and freedom of all, let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, who could favor, we pray, and all who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world, the prosperity of peoples, and the assistance of peace, assurance of peace, and freedom of religion, may through your gift be made secure through Christ our Lord. Let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Almighty, Father, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Comfort every living God, comfort of mourners, strengthen all who toil. May the prayers of those who brought in many tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice because in their hour of need your mercy was at hand through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us let us pray, dearly beloved to God, the Father Almighty that he may raise his mighty hand to stop the spread of the COVID-19 virus, strengthen medical professionals and first responders, grant wisdom to those making decisions for the public welfare, and restore the sick and those who are afraid to, uh, to health and peace. Let us kneel.
Let us stand. Oh, my dear living God, we beg you to hear us as we devoutly raise our petitions to you and graciously turn away the pandemic of disease that afflicts us so that mortal hearts may recognize that these scourges proceed from sin that sickens us and cease only when we implore your divine mercy through Christ our Lord. Behold the wood of the cross, on which hung the Savior of the world.
as the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we wait the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The kingdom, the kingdom of the power, glory, glory, glory. Behold the Lamb of God, the only who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy of my word, but only to say the word.
for those who are participating by YouTube now, uh, we I invite you to join in this spiritual communion. I will pray it slowly, and you can pray it verbally or audibly or in your heart. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most blessed sacrament. I love you above all things. And I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Let us pray, Almighty and ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ. Preserve in us the work of your mercy, that partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you, to Christ our Lord. Amen. Bow down for the blessing. May the abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord. Amen.